Well, climate change is having many impacts on society through essentially the full range of climatic variables, temperature, rainfall, wind, water levels. As temperature goes up, we're, we find that we suffer more in terms of health. We use more energy to keep ourselves cooler. It puts stresses on plants and stresses on animals. But climate change also causes extreme temperature variations in both directions. So just as we, we can have extreme heat, we can also have extreme cold. It changes rainfall patterns. We might actually get the same amount of rain we've always had, but now instead of coming down in a nice gentle or even pattern throughout the whole summer and spring and fall, it might come down in very intense storms, causing floods and other water quality problems. The level of moisture in the soil, which the plants rely on, can change. If there's a lot more heat, there's a lot more evaporation, which means that there's a lot less moisture in the soil, which can have an impact on plant growth. Uh, people respond to those in different ways, and that's also part of the impacts. So for example, farmers may start to put more inputs into farming because of the problems they're having with soil moisture and temperature. But those impact, inputs, such as more fertilizer, will have other impacts downstream that we might not associate with climate, but they're just part of the secondary impacts we might see. Yes, climate change, not could, climate change will impact the spread of the disease, and it's already happening. So every time we hear about a new disease carried by an insect that we haven't heard of before, that's because our summers are becoming warmer, our winters are becoming warmer, and this allows these insects to multiply more rapidly here and survive over the winter. So West Nile virus is a result of a warmer climate in Ontario. Lyme disease, which is carried by a very small tick, we can't even see it. Ten years ago, it wasn't an issue here. Now we're starting to see cases in Ontario, and again because the tick is able to overwinter and and the bacteria that lives in that tick is able to overwinter with it, whereas before it couldn't do that. Uh, there are new diseases coming. Dengue fever may show up here. Malaria may make a comeback. And these are all tied to climate change. So the diseases we may see now are diseases that we used to associate with the tropics. Well, it's going to change a lot of how we live. So if, in general, our summers are hotter, and we have more extreme heat waves, we will want to change the way we build our buildings in order to reduce the amount of energy we need to cool the buildings. If we see more rainstorms like we did last year that result in extreme amounts of flooding, then we're going to want to build our cities differently so we can cope with that flooding. If we're having new diseases, think about what medical school will now be like in the future. You'll go to medical school in Ottawa and study tropical diseases because those are the diseases that we'll have to deal with. Think about the warnings given to students before they leave school in June. If you come down with anything that resembles the flu, go to the hospital because it probably is malaria, dengue fever, or Lyme disease. So those may seem trivial, but those types of change I think are only indicative. Uh, we, we may find that there's difficulty in growing food. We may find agriculture comes under stress, which means we're going to have to find different ways of growing our food or maybe find different regions of the planet where we can grow food. But if we have a problem growing food, that's going to put a number of stresses on the whole population. Now, our population is aging. You may not be aware of it, but I'm certainly aware of it. So as I get older under a hotter climate, there'll be some benefits perhaps in the winter but things will be harder for me in the summer. If I now have to deal with these new diseases, it will either put a bigger strain on the medical system or cause me more grief and perhaps shorten my life more pre prematurely. It's a small change in the average temperature, but it's not necessarily a small change in the temperature in any one place. So when we talk about the Arctic, we're talking about changes in temperature that might be 8 to 10 degrees centigrade. But even here, we may be seeing changes of four or five degrees. Some of our systems are so finely tuned that once we start to get above 32 degrees, we're into extreme heat. And right now, we're not conditioned 
meaning us people, for long bouts of that extreme heat. I think over time we will adapt biologically because there are cities that already deal with extreme heat and they have, the people have adapted. But it may not take as much of a change as we think to really change the way um, we live. But temperature is only one thing. Think about changes in wind speed that will affect the way the energy is produced, but it also will affect stresses on infrastructure. Think about changes in the way precipitation comes down. We'll do a very trivial one. If you like to ski, you might not be able to ski here anymore. It's not such a big shift in temperature, but enough that there won't be a, we won't be able to sustain a snow cover in places that aren't that far north of Toronto, which are now considered prime places to go skiing. Or we might not have even enough of a cold spell to make snow, again, to sustain that cover with even artificial snow. So there are sectors that might disappear. On the other hand, someone once asked me, will we grow mangoes on the Mississippi? I don't think so. I don't think we'll get that type of shift. And if we did, then the, then the uh, problems in other places would be far worse. But there will be changes in what we grow. We'll be able to perhaps expand agriculture much further north, which could, might seem positive, except we might not have the water available to sustain that expansion, unless we can develop ways of low-cost ways of desalination or recycling water. As the summers get warmer, you'll get more evaporation. More evaporation means lower lake levels. We've already been seeing the problems of lower lake levels for regional economies and tourism, property values, and just people complaining. On the other hand, there's more beach areas, so maybe there's a bit of a trade-off there. Lower lake levels also have other impacts because it means it doesn't some of the mixing that goes on in the deeper lake, in, in the deeper levels, might not happen quite as frequently because in lakes such as Lake Erie that are already shallow, they're now getting shallower. Now, you take a sudden rainstorm like we had last July, that washes a bunch of crap into the lake. Some of that stuff we consider waste, but there are things we don't like in the lake that consider it food, and they explode. So you mix that warmer temperature, the lower lake levels, and washing food for algae, let's say, into the lake or bacteria, and you get explosive growth. Now, once that stuff starts to die, it's eaten by other bacteria. That consumes oxygen. That creates large zones of low oxygen. That kills fish. So, those are some of the impacts. Now this winter we had that huge ice cover on the lake. We had an extreme winter. We can see that and that had the opposite effect. It raised lake levels, depressed evaporation, uh, and we'll see that occasionally too. But for the most part I think we may expect lower lake levels, more water quality problems, uh, and more episodes where the, of eutrophication where fish die because of the consumption of algae and We'll, and we'll see more of those natural fish kills. Well, the polar regions are warming up faster than we are. Uh, the way the climate works is the further away you get from the equator, the more dynamic the changes are. And we're finding that both the Antarctic and the Arctic are going through some dramatic changes. The biggest change, the one that caught us off guard, is not that we have an ice-free Arctic, it's how fast it happened. So, Ten years ago, we knew there'd be an ice-free Arctic, but we didn't expect it to happen in 2013. Having a lack of ice in the Arctic, we, well, we know the big effect is on polar bears. Now, we also know that opens up the Arctic for resource exploration and shipping, and that may be seen as a positive impact, but that will, is going to create all sorts of geopolitical tensions as countries vie for who has ownership over the Arctic. Uh, but w once you change the patterns, any peoples there who are still relying off some form of indigenous lifestyle, that will be affected if not totally destroyed because those indigenous lifestyles were based on certain types of winters happening in a certain length of winter. Uh, so other animals besides the polar bear may rely on uh, the temperature changes that we've had for the last 10,000 years. So we know the polar bears may have may be stressed because of the lack of ice in various parts of the Arctic. There are other animal species in the Arctic uh, that may rely on 
seasons the way they were, not the way they're going to be. So they will have to adapt or they will come under stress. Now on the other hand, we may see uh, new, and new species migrating north as escaping the warmer temperatures in the south. So now you're going to get a new species moving in, in an area that doesn't have a large food supply, perhaps competing with an older species for, for, for that food supply. So there could be some uh, tremendous ecological changes in the Arctic. And finally, the indigenous lifestyles, although a lot of people no longer live a truly indigenous lifestyle as they might have lived 100 or 200 years ago, any parts of that lifestyle that rely on the um, longer winters, the colder winters, will have to change because those, the new climate won't support that. The way the climate system is um, constructed or has evolved, the changes are, if you take, are more dynamic or more dramatic as you move north and south of the equator. And they're happening faster. And so that's why the elders are noticing them much more than we are. The other, other reason is, in many ways, we have uh, an infrastructure here that allows us to be sheltered from the earliest impacts. Uh, and then, whereas in the Arctic, they don't have the same level of infrastructure. So a simple example, it gets much warmer here we may not notice that day to day because we're in air conditioned buildings and we're in air conditioned cars, which is something you might not, that level of energy consumption, you might not find in the Arctic. So they will notice it much quicker. We don't necessarily rely on growing our own food and catching our own fish. There's still people living further north of us that do rely on hunting, fishing, and their own food gathering for part of their food supply. So they will notice a change in that uh, because they're used to a certain pattern every year and that's now changing. There'll be changes. I don't want to say they're similar because the temperature rise may not be as dramatic. Uh, but, and we're set up differently. So for example, most of us don't rely on uh, fishing to get our food. But the changes we might see is our food may come from different places. Uh, it might be more expensive, it might be more scarce. So we'll see the change in a different way. I'm not sure we'll see a lot of flooding in the Arctic, but we may see more flooding here. So again, that will be a, a different change. I'm not sure dengue fever will make it up to the Arctic, but it will make it here, or Lyme disease. So again, the, the diseases that we'll face versus what they face will be different. And again, I think there are certain resiliencies that we have, certain impacts, or, uh, and certain resiliencies that people in the Arctic have to certain impacts that will, again, allow us to delay the effect or delay seeing the effect. Uh, I don't know what all those are, but I guess we'll start to find out um, over the years. But one other factor that will change what will happen is whether or not we do anything. So if we don't do anything anymore to reduce emissions, the rate of temperature change here will, will eventually approach the rate we're seeing now in the Arctic. We will see much higher temperature changes. And once we see those, again, I don't want to say the impacts will be the same, but we'll, we'll have some very dramatic impacts if, in fact, the rate of greenhouse gas emissions stays the same or even increases. It's very easy to despair because we haven't really taken a real dramatic action in a way we need to do to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I think eventually we will get there. I think it's just going to have to get a lot worse before we realize we can't go on with business as usual. So it's a mixture of hope and despair. I'm, I'm hopeful for the future, but farther into the future. But I think we're, we're, we're st still going to see some fairly dramatic changes before we decide to take action. Yeah, so the Lifetime Achievement Award was for the work I've done in green roof and green wall and green infrastructure research. And it goes back to uh, some conversations happening in, right around here in 1995 and 96 
about how we, what we could do to make, get rid of window air conditioners and how we might make the windows look nicer. And we did experiments with green curtains, meaning curtains made from plants. And that led to a raft of research ideas and research first uh, in the area of green roofs and green walls. So I was helped the National Research Council set up the very first green roof field site in North America. Uh, I was instrumental creating the very first building energy model hooked to a green roof and doing one of the first simulations of a city with and without green roofs and looking at the urban heat island. And my work influenced the bylaw or the benefit analysis for the bylaw in Toronto. And then I was able to help write the biodiversity guidelines for green roofs in Toronto. So eventually someone said, well, that's a lifetime achievement. <laughs> and every year they, they evaluate whether or not there's a worthy candidate. Some years we don't give it out. And in 2012, um, they called me and said, well, guess what? You're going to get the Lifetime Achievement Award. So I thought that was... I was very touched by it. I was at a stage of my life when I thought I might be totally leaving that line of work. Instead, I just shifted from energy to water. But I was, I was very touched to get the award. I didn't expect to see it till I was about 75. Mm -hmm. Green roofs are essentially a way of growing vegetation on a roof. Uh, it's not just dirt and seeds and plant, but you could do it that way. You might damage your roof. It's a technology that allows you to grow the vegetation while storing water and protecting the roof from damage that might be caused by the water or by a wayward invasive plant with a long root. The reason we put the green roofs up on various buildings is they help protect the building. They extend the life of the roof membrane. So right now, the roof membrane on a typical industrial building might be 15 to 20 years. Same with a house. The green roof will double that and maybe triple that. Uh, but it will also, in certain buildings, reduce energy consumption. And here's the interesting thing, in summer and winter. In fact, the effects in winter may be more dramatic than summer. It will store water, so when we get those heavy rainstorms, it will delay the release of that water into the drainage system of the city, which will help reduce the, the severity of flooding if we ha have a lot of green roofs. They could be used for food production, and they could be used for recreation. One of the most interesting green roofs I saw was on a pub in Minneapolis, and it was mowed very short, and it was used for lawn bowling on the roof of the pub. So I, I think that we're only just beginning to see some of the possibilities of what we might do with this technology. So right now, uh, it's still roughly double the cost of a conventional roof. So if a conventional roof, let's say, is $7 a square foot, and I think those are 1990 prices, $10 a square foot, a green roof might be $20 a square foot. Not surprisingly, a number of cities actually have subsidies for, for green roofs a certain size, including Toronto, uh, and other cities have other ways of convincing people to put one on by giving them other incentives. Okay. So first, I was a member, <laughs> uh, and what we did, my task group specifically made sure that the... Oh, okay, back up. I was a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC task group, and our role was to make sure the information from climate models was available in a way that people could use it to do either research or decision making. So did our, our group probably had some impact because we were the ones who made sure the data was available that people could use. The IPCC, I think, has shifted the argument uh, or the perception. What they've done is um, every few years they release an assessment of the research that tells us where we are. Every few years, the public gets an earful of how we're doing on climate change. And I think even though it happens every four or five years, it at least keeps it in the public eye. But because every government in the world is involved in writing that assessment, it brings everybody together, and they have to really fight about what is going to go into that assessment. But that political exercise does a tremendous amount to raise awareness globally, not amongst scientists, not, but amongst decision makers, the people who are actually representing the governments of those countries.
The North American Greenroof Research Committee was put together to provide a forum for anybody doing research in green roofs to have a connection with the industry and the designers and to also try and provide a forum that we could talk to each other and share issues. I remember when we first got together, the big thing we spoke about was funding. How do we get money for the research? Then it sort of shifted to, well, how do we do the research? Like, let's talk about how we're actually doing the research. Can we compare our research results to each other? And then we started to, when I was chair of the, I was chair of that committee, and when I was chair of the Green Roof Research Committee, I wanted to start to develop protocols for research, and by that I mean a standardized way of doing it so we can compare apples to apples. And we were able to write the protocol for biodiversity research on green roofs. That turned out to be one of the easier ones and less contentious. Uh, we tried to tackle stormwater runoff, and that was a little bit more difficult, so, so we, we didn't get there. But it also provides a voice not only for the research community, but for other people to talk to the research community. So the industry association could talk to us and say, here's what we need to know. And it allowed us to say to them, here's what we can tell you. And so I think it really provided for a good exchange of what the state of the knowledge was about this technology. Well, I think probably there were two areas um, that might have had the biggest impact. So one was all the work on green roofs. I think that green roofs are one of those strategies that can have an impact on climate change by reducing energy requirements and reducing the summer temperatures in a city. So I think those two things are fairly important and also reduce the impacts of climate by reducing the amount of water that escapes into the city during an intense rainstorm. The other area that isn't quite as well known uh, is the work I've done on, did on energy modeling. And I built the, probably the only community planning energy model on a spreadsheet that actually incorporates something called exergy, which is really a measure of true energy efficiency. And basically what it does is it, it matches the energy sources with the energy demands. Now that was built for Natural Resources Canada, which is a federal agency, and I think that has the potential for planning energy systems that are truly efficient, but also are responsive to greenhouse gas emission targets. So that could have the longest term impact. We'll just have to wait and see. Because a cobweb was built actually as a theoretical exercise. I was told, build us, build us something to explore the chaos and complexity theoretically, and then we'll see if we can learn anything to apply to adaptation. So that's what Kabul was initially, and people kept saying, well, what does it represent? I said, nothing. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a general population abstracted from something real, but what you learn about it, we can then hopefully go back and look at a real population. What happened was my students, they kept saying, no, 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 we're going to do something really applied, and then they kept asking for more features. When I had a programming staff, I would then talk to the staff, can we put those features into Cobweb? So that led to things such as aging, uh, economics, learning, genetics, and eventually became fairly complex. And then the school board got a hold of it, and they said, well, we actually would like to have the heat island in there, and we'd like to have the disease, uh, vector-borne diseases such as malaria put in there. So Cobweb is still a simulation model that can explore chaos and complexity. But now you can actually use it to explore new diseases, the impact of heat waves, uh, evolutionary questions, genetic questions, questions of ethics, uh, the emergence of economic clusters. Now, all these things are complex systems. So in many ways, Cobweb was well suited to explore that, but it's gone far beyond its initial uh, conception. In fact, one, in 2001, I told people Cobweb is complete. I said, we've done everything, there's nothing more we can add to it. It does everything it should do. And if you look at the 2001 cobweb and the one we completed in 2011, they are vastly different. <laughs> cobweb is an agent-based simulation model. What we mean by that is it allows you to see each member of the population and what happens to them as they go through a process of change. The change could happen at the population level or it could happen at the individual level. But you can watch that visually on the screen. Uh, young people 
have a great responsibility because as much despair as I have, it's young people that can change that. It's the next generation coming up that will eventually inherit the decisions on how energy is used, how energy is produced, and how we adapt to climate change. So if young people now start to get into the mindset that they can do what they want to do, but they can do it in ways that use less energy, or they can start to do the research to look at generating energy in different ways. And you know some of these young people, Maya. Um, so we have young people doing research on microbial fuel cells, producing energy from garbage. No fossil fuel is burned. We have young people producing energy from the expansion of water. No fossil fuel, well actually maybe they are burning a bit of fossil fuel to heat the water, but far less than what we would burn to produce the same energy. Uh, I met someone who produced electricity from sound waves. That type of innovation, as well as the mindset that we can actually do things in a different way. And one other thing, young people are better at asking the question, why does it have to be this way? By the time you get to my age, you begin to be more accepting of the way things are. A young person looks at the world and says, well, why, does it, why is it that way? When they ask their parents that question, the parents will say, because that's the way it is. But eventually, many of them will say, no, it doesn't have to be that way. So the curiosity, the challenging of authority, um, the ability to maybe get used to doing things in a different way with less energy, and some of the innovations and in research that young people are doing, I think those together will have a big impact. So one other thing I notice about young people, fewer of them are getting driver's licenses. And I used to think this was a bad thing. And there's literature in sociology that talks about how the rates of exclusion amongst populations that don't drive because they can't get to where they have to go. But let's think about a 20% decline in driver's licenses in the next cohort. That has to have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. If that were global, that might have a tremendous impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So for all you young people deciding not to drive, Here's to you. <laughs> so permafrost is literally a permanent ice feature underneath the ground in the Arctic. It was so permanent that we built on it. We not only put buildings on top of it, we put pipelines in it. It was basically like building into concrete. Now that permafrost is starting to melt. Now imagine you built your house on this and now it's going like this. What's your house going to do? It's going to collapse, or your building is. Imagine you have a pipeline running through that permafrost and it starts to do this. Or maybe it's just above, or even below, but probably above the permafrost. And again, you have, you have something on top of it, and now it's, getting, it's vibrating. So permafrost melting means that, again, anything that's adapted, any lifestyle that is adapted to being on that permafrost is going to change or is in jeopardy. And so we've already heard stories about building collapsing in Arctic communities. That's due to melting permafrost. So we can't really stop that. We have to really be aware that anything that's built on the permafrost is in jeopardy. There are the greenhouse gases that might, might be trapped uh, in that. Uh, so we, we hear about carbon dioxide all the time, and, and we sort of have a sense of, you know, a mindset of what that would do without really thinking that there are five other greenhouse gases, one of them being methane. Uh, me methane is actually uh, even more effective at trapping heat than carbon dioxide is. And so the release of large amounts of methane, and it has to be large, but large um, could actually accelerate a process that's already being accelerated. So it's not, so it'll make it worse, it'll just make it worse faster. Now, why is that bad? We're on a very, very slow trajectory to hitting a stabilized level of carbon dioxide. If we now release another greenhouse gas in large amounts into the atmosphere, that will just make our job even tougher. It either means we have to get stricter on carbon dioxide or we're going to have to adapt faster. Uh, so, uh, but, but again, it has to be enough to trigger that fast feedback.